Saturday, December 30th. Unbeknownst to them, this would be the last day for the entire Miyazawa family. The family of four would be brutally murdered on this fateful night, becoming victims of one of Japan's most horrifying and enigmatic mysteries. This is the untold murder mystery of the Goldilocks killings. By most accounts, the Miyazawa family was a typical Japanese household. Mikio Miyazawa, the family patriarch aged 44, worked for Interbrand, a London-based marketing agency. Mikio was described as the kind of man who got along with everyone, definitely not the type of person to make enemies. Yasuku Miyazawa, the family's 41-year-old mother and wife, was much the same. She was a teacher who spent a lot of time with the couple's two children. Nina, 8 years old, and Ray, 6 years old. Nina, the daughter, was in second grade and appeared to be a typical little girl. She was cheerful, happy, and enjoyed soccer and dance, all of which she was quite involved in. Ray, the family's youngest member, had been going through an issue lately. He had a speech impairment, which had been causing the family a fair amount of stress. Apparently, they had started to seek out professional help for the matter. Mikio and Yusuku had moved into their Setagaya home on Kamisoshigaya Street in 1991. It was a flourishing development at the time with over 200 families, and it seemed like a decent enough place to raise children. Or so they thought. The Miyazawa home was a shared building that was split into two, so from the outside it appeared to be one house, but it was actually a duplex. It allowed the Miyazawas to reside right next door to Yusuku's family mostly her mother, but also her sister and brother-in-law, who lived with her during this time period. Soon, Miyazawa started to lose more and more of their neighbors, who sold their land to the city. Tokyo already had plans for this area to expand nearby Soshigaya Park. By the time the year 2000 rolled by, there were only four houses left. It became a ghost town of a neighborhood. Most of the activity from the area was happening in the skate park, right behind the Miyazawa family home. This led to some issues for the family. See, the skate park was located directly behind the house, separated only by a fence. In the week leading up to New Year's Eve, Mikio had confronted a group of loud and obnoxious teenagers at the skate park for making too much of a racket. At around the same time, a witness reported seeing him confront a group of young rebels that belonged to the Basusuku, a Japanese motorcycle gang of sorts. Due to these issues, both families, just like their neighbors, planned to eventually move away and had already sold off their land to the city. In the end, they never got to move. Apparently in the summer months, the community had started to notice some of the area's animals being physically tormented. There are rumors that rodents had been found, having been killed, and even the local cats, mostly strays, had been tortured. One eyewitness recalls seeing a stray that they were friendly with suddenly appear without a tail one day. The 25th of December, Christmas Day, Yasuku mentioned to her father-in-law that a strange car had been parking in front of their house. This would happen several occasions, despite the fact that there was other parking nearby, which wouldn't require the person parking to jump over a fence. Two days later, on the 27th, a man estimated to be in his 40s was seen walking around the Miyazawa family home by an eyewitness. A seemingly innocent thing, as the park nearby ensures that people would be in the area for a variety of reasons, but in retrospect, looks suspicious. On December the 29th, the day before the crime, a man was seen near Seju Gakuin My Station located just a few miles away from where the Miyazawa family was living. This man was wearing a skater type of outfit, along with a very small backpack. The eyewitness clearly remembered this because the man was underdressed for the weather, so she took note of it. It was on this day, the 29th, that the police believe a man matching this rough description purchased a sashimi knife from the same shopping area. It was the only one purchased at the supermarket on the day, so it was relatively easy to trace. 
On December the 30th, a man matching the same description was spotted near Sengawa Station, roughly a mile away from where the Mizawas lived. This man was stated to be in the age range of 35 to 40 years old and appeared to be getting closer and closer to the Miyazawa family home. They went about their daily lives, getting ready for the upcoming holiday. The family apparently went shopping in the early evening, around 6pm. We don't know if all four family members left, but an eyewitness reported seeing them at a nearby shopping centre around that time. A neighbour who drove by their house that evening remembered seeing the family car missing around 6.30pm. Yasuko called her mother next door around 7pm that night. The families frequently used the phone to communicate with one another, viewing themselves as neighbours. The conversation itself was most likely ordinary, with Yasuko asking her mother if she wanted to see her granddaughter. This is supported by Nina going next door to watch a recorded TV show until about 9.30pm. Everything had been relatively normal for the Miyazawa family up until this point in the night. The Miyazawa family's last recorded activity is an accessed email, which was read around 10.38pm that evening. Mikio was reading a work email that had been password protected, implying that he was likely personally responsible for opening it. We know that at least one member of the Miyazawa family was alive at this time, and their normally peaceful and tranquil home was about to be transformed into a house of horrors. At around 10pm that evening, a witness walking around the park behind the Miyazawa house heard what sounded like an argument taking place inside of the house. They didn't recall any loud physical noises, but they said it just sounded like a couple getting heated at one another. About an hour and a half later, a member of Yasuku's family next door would hear a loud banging sound come from the Miyazawa's side of the building. They weren't sure of the exact time, but were able to estimate it later on based on the schedule of television programming at the time. This was around the same time that someone, an eyewitness or perhaps a neighbour, recalled seeing a man hurrying along the walking path that travelled next to the family's house. These were the only three signs that something was amiss that night in Setagaya. The terror that would unfold in the Miyazawa home wouldn't be discovered for hours. Within the close proximity of the Miyazawa house, a taxi driver was picking up three passengers. They were all middle-aged men, all of whom remained quiet throughout their journey. The taxi driver recalled this as being very odd for the time, as it was well past midnight at this point, and these three men were being dropped off at a nearby station not too far away. One of these men apparently had a wound on him and left a bloodstain on the back seat of the cab. However, the driver would have no reason to panic until the details of what had happened that night became known throughout Tokyo. The next morning, on the 31st of December, New Year's Eve, Yasuku's mother tried calling her daughter's family to make plans for later that afternoon. Surprisingly, her call wouldn't even go through, let alone ring. Unknown to her, the phone lines in the Miyazawa family home had been cut, purposely, disconnected by someone hours beforehand. She would then head outside and try the doorbell. She rang the doorbell to no answer, and according to the police report she would foul later, she used a set of keys to let herself in. The house itself was silent, with no noise to make out. As Yasuku's mother entered the house, she would have undoubtedly known something was very wrong. She began to discover the truth in mere seconds, as she made her way into the family's house, only to be confronted by the body of Mikio Miyazawa at the bottom of the staircase. The 44-year-old father had been stabbed multiple times and was lying lifeless at the bottom of the staircase. Yasuku's mother recalls going upstairs to the second story, to try and see what had happened to the rest of her family. Immediately, at the top of the stairs, she would find the bodies of her daughter Yasuku and her granddaughter Nina, both of whom who had been brutally stabbed dozens of times, far surpassing the levels of anguish that Mikio's body had received. Yasuku, her daughter, whom she had raised and been close with for over 40 years, and Nina, her granddaughter, whom she had been watching a television program with the evening before, both of whom were now cold and lifeless, loved ones transformed into corpses by an unknown killer. 
In a nearby bedroom, Yasuku's mother would be confronted by the final tragedy. Six-year-old Rei, who was still in bed, he had been strangled to death. This led investigators to think that he had been the first member of the family to be killed. Needless to say, Yasuku's mother, this now traumatized grandmother, would contact the police. But the things she had seen could never be unseen, and nothing would bring back the family she had just lost. At the scene, police began to look at the crime and piece together what had happened. Yasuku's mother, sister and brother-in-law, who had all been next door when the crime occurred, recalled anything odd or suspicious that might have happened that night. The only thing that struck a bell for them was the loud thud that had occurred around 11.30pm. Police immediately suspected that the thud might have occurred when Mikio, the father, confronted the supposed killer. Due to the wounds on his body, they believed that he had scuffled with his family's attacker, and the loud thud that Yasuku's family heard might have been him being thrown to the bottom of the stairs. The wounds that Mikio had sustained were multiple stabs, and mostly focused on his neck. They would quickly place together that the stab wounds had been made by a sashimi knife, which was left behind in the family's kitchen. This was the knife that had been purchased just a day beforehand at the local supermarket. However, in the process of attacking Mikio, the knife had broken in some way. Police immediately theorized that the broken knife had been just one of two murder weapons. The other was a knife the killer had found in Mikio and Yasuku's very own kitchen. Most unusual about Mikio's body being discovered is that he was still wearing day clothes, business-friendly attire that he would wear out and about. Supposedly, he was only wearing one shoe as well. Police had discovered that the second story bathroom window, accessible to the back of the house and located just above a fence separating from the park, was most likely how the killer had entered the house. The house was built in a way that at the top of the stairs leading up to the second story was a ladder leading up to the third story loft. The third story loft had a bed and a television. So many have assumed that both Yasuku and Nina were up there at the time of the murders, watching TV and perhaps lying down in bed. The bodies of both Yasuku and Nina were found at the bottom of the ladder leading up to the loft, having been stabbed multiple times. Investigators noted the stab wounds as being excessive and figured that both victims had been stabbed well beyond the point of death. The family's son Ray was found in bed having been strangled. Police were originally stumped as to why Ray had been saved of a brutal stabbing death like the rest of his family. But as they began to piece together the clues, figured that he was the first of the family to be killed. Evidence led police to the notion that the killer, instead of fleeing immediately after killing the family, had decided to stay in the house as an unwanted houseguest. He hadn't even gone through the trouble of covering up the four family members' bodies but decided to make himself comfortable for the evening. The killer had apparently napped on the family's living room sofa, which was one of the oddest developments in the story itself. Usually suspects flee from the scene as soon as they can, as each minute increases the odds of being discovered. But this killer had seemingly savoured the intimacy of living in his victim's home for a night. The killer had helped himself to food from the family's fridge, namely ice cream police would eventually discover four ice cream wrappers, with the supposed killer's fingerprints on them. The killer had also used the family computer, which was located in the downstairs study. They discovered that the computer had been accessed in the early morning of December the 31st, specifically at 1.18am, an hour or two after the family was likely murdered. They had visited a website previously bookmarked by Mikio, belonging to the Shiki Theatre Company. You see, Mikio had a history of working with the theatre, as it had been a passion of his, so one has to wonder if this was some kind of sick joke on behalf of the killer, or perhaps even the family was murdered hours after many believed them to be. However, at 1.18 in the morning, someone had visited the website and attempted to buy tickets for a show online and the odds remain heavily stacked in favour of the killer doing so. The killer had apparently also logged on hours later at approximately 10.05 in the morning to browse the websites of Mikio's company, Interbrand, and the school that Yasuko taught at. 
Strangely, the killer only browsed websites the family had bookmarked, perhaps to try and relish being in the intimacy of their home. After using the computer for a grand total of 10 minutes, the killer had then unplugged the computer from the wall. Throughout the night, the killer had gathered an assortment of the family's ID and credit cards, which were all found sorted in the family's living room. Many have theorized that this was an attempt by the killer to try and guess the pin codes needed to use the cards. Once he left the scene, he was unlikely to try and keep guessing and risk exposure, so he left them behind. Before leaving, the killer had also gathered an odd variety of the family's belongings and garbage and put them in the bathtub. These items were mainly garbage, such as ice cream wrappers or advertising leaflets that had been cut up, but also contained some of Mikio's work receipts and Yasuku's school documents, along with some feminine sanitary items that contained the killer's blood. Police suspected that the killer had stolen some money from the family, approximately 150,000 yen. That's roughly the equivalent to over $1,000. Much to the police investigator's surprise, the crime scene was absolutely covered in evidence. First and foremost, the police had uncovered the holy grail of any investigation by discovering the murder weapons early on. Both knives, the one purchased on the 29th and the other one, one of the Miyazawa's kitchen knives, were found easily in the kitchen with blood still on them. Besides the knives, though, police would uncover that the Miyazawa family home was a treasure trove of evidence, leading them to piece together what had happened that night. They would find the family's first aid kit had been opened, likely by Yasuko and Nina sometime during the assault itself. Some of the pieces of bandaging from the first aid kit were found with eight-year-old Nina's blood on them. In the upstairs bathroom, police would find unflushed feces. This had apparently been left by the killer either too ignorant of DNA testing or too proud of his ability to get away with it. Upon investigation, analysts would discover remnants of a sesame spinach dish containing string beans which had likely been eaten elsewhere. In the years since, internet users have called this somewhat of a boring dish, the kind a mother would feed her son. This has evolved into a leading theory of a man that still lived at home with his mother all over the house, left behind haphazardly in bloodstains and in dirt. They were the footprints of the assumed killer. These shoe prints would become widely known as belonging to a specific type of Slazenger shoe. Slazenger shoes at this point in time were available all over Japan. But the shoe print left behind was a very specific size, not found in Japan. This shoe size was a Korean shoe size and the shoe would have likely only been found for sale in South Korea, which jump-started many theories about the killer's ethnicity. Other than the bandages from the first aid kit used by 8-year-old Nina, there were also towels and women's sanitation towels which were found with unknown blood on them. To detectives, this was a startling find. It gave credence to the notion that Mikio had fought the attacker on the stairs, likely resulting in an injury to the killer that required quick medical attention of his own. Police would have to send the blood samples away for testing, a process that is by no means an overnight solution. Until then, they would have to keep searching for evidence which the killer had left behind, as if intentionally. The most startling evidence uncovered in the investigation was a variety of clothing and items brought by the killer and then simply abandoned. The killer had likely worn an outfit to the crime scene which was detailed as clothing a skater would wear. The items were one grey crusher hat, one black airtech jacket, a white and purple long-sleeved shirt, black Edwin gloves, a multicoloured scarf without any tags, and a black handkerchief. Other than the clothing, however, the killer left behind yet more evidence in the form of personal items. The hip bag itself was rather innocent looking, but did contain some pieces of evidence that would continue to guide the way investigators approached the case. The first piece of evidence was a piece of grip tape used for the surface of skateboards. The second was the trace elements of Dracar Noir, the cologne found on the handkerchief. The last piece of evidence taken from the hip bag, most shockingly, was sand. A question you might be asking yourself now is who carried out this sadistic murder? Some noteworthy possessions that would help with identifying this man is a handkerchief. 
as police discovered that the item had been ironed prior to use. This was odd, simply because very few people would go through the effort of ironing a handkerchief. Plus, the idea of a young skater using a handkerchief is in itself somewhat of an odd notion. Internet theorists have attributed the handkerchief being ironed to another clue of the alleged killer living at home with a mother figure. All of the clothing items were found to have been washed in hard water, meaning that the water used to clean the clothing was full of minerals and vitamins not usually found in the regular occurring water. You see, Japan has long used a soft water system, meaning that the water itself is just water with some sodium. This would be a point in favour of labelling the killer someone of Korean heritage, since Korea uses a hard water system which would lead police to believe that the clothes were washed the way that they were found. The sand found in the hip bag could be identified by the area it came from, which pointed to the southwestern United States, more specifically the approximate area around Edwards Air Force Base, the military installation about 100 miles north of Los Angeles. Over the years, no new answers have come to light. The unknown killer had become an urban legend, the type told by those who remembered an entire family murdered by a midnight demon. Using the blood left on towels, DNA genome testing had been utilized to find out exactly what kind of person this killer was, and the results were unexpected. Police discovered that the likely killer of the Miyazawa family was mixed race and probably not a Japanese citizen. The killer's parents had belonged to two varying cultures, one of which was Eastern Asian and the other was of Southern European descent. Some would find this baffling that the killer was never found, as he would think it couldn't be too difficult to identify a mixed race person in Japan as well as the fact they had a large shoe size, which to the majority of Japanese people would be seen as unusually large. This would point to the fact that the killer was most likely taller than the average Japanese man. With over 240,000 detectives and over 12,000 pieces of evidence, the investigation into the murders is one of the biggest in Japanese history. All case-related evidence is still being held in custody. Numerous police detectives are still working on the investigation now, although they have made no progress since they first started. Only dead ends have been found in this case. The case has never even come close to being solved, but is still actively being pursued and still very much on people's minds in Japan. Here is a list of references used for this video. Thank you for watching my first YouTube video, I hope you enjoyed it, and stick around if you would like to venture into the exploration of Japan's dark side of mysteries and murders. I would appreciate any sort of feedback or constructive criticisms to further my content's quality. I hope by talking about this story it has brought some light to the Miyazawa family. Finally, please do let me know your opinions on the murder case itself, and any conclusions you may be able to bring to the table.